pieces of information before we get started. Um, one, budget hearings are mandated by New York State Ed Law. Uh, we have been involved in this budget process since the last budget. It's been a year-long process. Some folks have seen the information. I would encourage folks to take a look at the website, the FAQ page, um, and additional places where I'm sure folks are getting information. Uh, for this evening, uh, because this is not a board meeting, it does not follow the standard one half hour protocol, even though it's scheduled for a half hour. Uh, traditionally speaking, there's been um, few folks who have showed up and that was the reason for it. We understand that that will not be the case this evening. And so we will go beyond the half hour to allow for uh, all folks who are here to participate. So please know that going in. Uh, each person will have three minutes, and given the uh, number of folks who choose to speak, as well as a full board meeting after this, um, I'm going to politely, as politely as I possibly can, stop people at three minutes. At any point in time, you would like to share the rest of your comments with the board clerk. It will be circulated to all board members, uh, so you have that option as well, and we would enter it to make sure that all board members would receive uh at the end of all people speaking we will allow an opportunity for board responses if there are any board responses um, another way in which is to make sure that the board clerk has your email folks may follow up via that way in case there's additional research or information that may provide the answers to your questions if there are any uh, so please know that you may not receive an answer this evening but we will do our best to make sure that we respond to folks requests and in accordance with board policy, we um, humbly ask that we not name any employee or school board member uh, to keep our comments as much as possible to the topic at hand, which is the budget. And um, this is a personal request from me. I have not run this by our board members, um, but I know from our board candidates and I know from other board colleagues, um, and I can tell from some of the looks that I'm receiving now that this is a particularly contentious um, topic that's full of emotion and rightfully so. Um, and again, it's a humble ask to try to be as cordial as possible that we may not agree. That part I understand, um, but trying to build the community and understanding that we live in a community and we will see each other um, before, after this uh, budget vote and this evening as well. And so those are my quick words of introduction as the board president and uh, Moira Lang is the board vice president. Um, Moira Lang will be reading the names of folks who have signed up. Um, I also ask that you would give Moira grace um, for name pronunciation. Um, we would ask that once your name is called, uh, that if you would please come to the microphone, please pronounce your name correctly so we can enter it into the minutes. And also because we know that we have a large group of people listening at home, if you could do your best to speak into the microphone, we may be able to hear you here in the room, but we want to make sure folks can hear you online or hear the recordings afterwards when folks replay that. Uh, board colleagues, did I miss anything? If people want to sit and speak, is that I believe that microphone is on as well. The microphone is adjustable. Uh, the microphone stand, I don't know if it's adjustable, but folks can either come stand or please feel free to sit. Thank you very much, Katie. Sorry. We not well. This is a wireless mic. I believe we probably would be able to move it around if need be. Okay. All right, good folks. Uh, we will commence, and I will uh, yield to my colleague Moira Lane. We're starting with comment. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Henrik Spoon. <coughs> Oh, Henrik Spoon. Um, last night I read on Ithaca.com that uh, according to NYSED, four out of 12 of ISED schools were cited for poor academic performance. For me, this was news, especially that my daughter's school, Boynton, is among these. I learned that 60% of African-American students in Boynton are chronically absent, and that only 26% of eighth graders are proficient in math. My daughter is in seventh grade. 
Early this morning, I asked our school's principal whether she had informed the parents of this citation and her plans for turning the ship around. She has so far not responded. How can we have had the 21st highest tax levy increase out of 668 districts in the year 2023-2024 and receive such a bad report card for this year? How can schools in our area with far more poverty, much smaller budgets, and much smaller tax levy increases outperform Ithaca City School District? And so why should we improve, approve a 8.4 higher property tax levy next week if the ICSD administration cannot steer our school district out of these troubled waters with the increased funding we already provided. That's my question to you. Robert Lynch. Good evening, Robert Lynch, Town of Enfield. I am a member of the Enfield Town Board, but I want to make it clear I am here tonight as an individual 55-year resident of the Ithaca City School District and not representing my board. However, I believe my experience on the Town Board perhaps um, provides me some insight into some of the things that are being done in the financial area tonight with regards to the budget. I'm going to speak specifically not about the budget, but about the $125 million capital expenditure that voters are being asked to approve along with the budget. And my, my insight is that there is so much non-specificity about so much as what was being proposed in this capital expenditure. It started, because I was at a number of these meetings, as you are well aware, Started last November talking about, well, there were three options. There was a $15 million expenditure just to electrify the existing bus garage. And we could add $40 million in total to not only electrify the garage, but to build a brand new one. Then I would say stars and dollar signs got in people's eyes. And they started saying, well, we could do this, and we could do this, and we could do this. And we're not even going to say what specifically is going to be. It's going to be roofs. It's going to be kitchens. And yes, that pie chart that I had back in November said clocks as well. So it's a question in my mind as to what we're spending this on. And I know there was at least one board member who said, let's go slow on this. And I think she was right. I think the voters are going to get the bad impression that what you're asking for is a cornucopia of capital extravagance. And I fear that. And really, I think this is our first, last, and only chance to vote on this. Yes, the board will vote individually on specific bonding items later. But this is the only chance we, the voters, get. Now, about that bus garage, I'm just going to talk briefly about that. I drive by that bus garage just about every day. The walls are secure. The roof looks good. I bet you the hydraulic lifts work just fine in it. And the board seems to have rejected, and the administration has rejected, uh, putting an addition onto that bus garage instead of tearing it down and starting brand new. And I think it behooves the district to look very carefully at that option. I know there was an administrator who said, when we start to look at the cost for square footage or renovation of something that is that outdated, it can be done. But I think that the cost to put you all in a new facility was a better way to go. Well, frankly, I'd like to see that cost breakdown. And that was what I have to say. I would also say, please consider building onto the existing garage, not tearing it down. And I thank you for your time. Scott Jenke.
Scott Yonke. Sorry. All right. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Dear parents, grandparents, guardians, and community members, as a fellow, fellow community member and concerned parent of two elementary children, I'm compelled to express my thoughts regarding the upcoming vote for a school budget. While many may be inclined to support it unquestionably, it is a crucial it is crucial in serving the best interests of our children to scrutinize the budget proposal with a critical eye before making a decision. Similarly, it is our responsibility to seek out support and vote for community representatives who will do the same on our behalf. Transparency is paramount in any public institution, particularly when it comes to allocating taxpayer funds. Unfortunately, the current budget lacks the level of detail necessary for taxpayers to make an informed decision. Additionally, the tax assessments with projected school tax bills all district homeowners have received provide an inaccurate picture of the financial burden each of us will incur. The IECSD superintendent indicated that 70% of the budget will support labor costs. However, missing from their attempts to pull at the collective heartstrings of an exceedingly loyal community known for decades for unwavering tax and teacher support is a clearly defined allocation of taxpayer funds to our district's healthily staffed if not grossly overstaffed administration salaries versus the salaries of teachers, TAs, aides, and other vital personnel. Our teachers deserve to be paid well and to be, be provided necessary incentives to retain committed veterans while attracting young, committed educators to our classrooms. In the past few years, ICSD has had problems retaining teachers, evidenced by vacancies, teachers, and other personnel leaving the district. These retention and hiring issues are not due to salary, but to a host of other, other issues occurring within the district and individual schools that will not be solved by salary increases alone. Year after year, we support our budget, and now we are paying dearly for that unconditional support. The, the school district and Board of Education have come to expect this financial support to the point that they seemingly no longer respect it. Despite all of our administrative presence, Teachers feel unsupported when it comes to a host of issues affecting student academic success and social emotional growth. A truly committed administrative support network could solve the problems and return our district to its former glory. This does not require money so much as it requires leadership. Accountability is essential to ensure funds are being used effectively and efficiently while investing in, our, while investing in education is vital Finally, approving budgets without adequate oversight leads to wasteful spending and missed opportunities for improvement. Without mechanisms in place to evaluate the impact of previous expenditures and hold decision makers accountable, we risk perpetuating systemic inefficiencies while ne neglecting areas in need of attention. Very sadly, this was evidence in our district by the fact that four schools, both middle schools and two elementary schools, are part of the 7% of schools in New York State that are not in good standing academically. I implore my fellow community members to join me in voting no on the school budget until such time the ICSD administration demonstrates a commitment to transparency, accountability, and real edu educational achievement for all of our children. Thank you. Somebody who is signed up simply as Kelly. Oh, Barb Herman. <laughs> Gotta lower this way. Testing. Okay. My name is Barb Herman. Oh, yeah, 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 it's saying. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Yes, and I live in uh, downtown Ithaca. And I would like to talk about the fact that we have a three pronged tax problem in the city of Ithaca our county taxes, our city taxes. And the biggest one, our school district taxes are way too high. And what do we get for our money? Oh, oh okay. Y'all hear that? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Oh, I hear the echo. Okay, so what do we get for our money? 
Seems like the more money we throw at the Ithaca school system, the worse the results. We're just a town like many others across the state, let alone across America, and it's unrealistic to be everything to everybody. We can't afford to solve national systemic problems on the backs of the few taxpayers we have in our district. So what to do? Start by trimming the fat, especially at the administrator's level. Not only are they overpaid, and probably too many of them, there is mismanagement, frivolous spending, and lack of accountability. Seems like the, the admins can't balance a checkbook like the rest of us and use our tax dollars like a kid with a credit card. Instead of threatening us with firing teachers if we don't vote yes, give them a raise to a competitive rate with the, some of the money saved so we don't lose them to other districts. The rest of the savings should be used to give us taxpayer, taxpayers a tax break. In addition, Cornell should be paying its fair share on all three of those prongs. But first, we got a clean house. Otherwise, we're just throwing good money after bad. On the subject of electric buses, you would think that a card-carrying tree hugger like myself would be all for it. Just because a product appears to be quote unquote green doesn't mean it is. Apparently, technology has not caught up with the, this unfunded mandate by the state of New York. If you use our tax dollars to purchase a fleet of buses that can't handle our cold climate, nor our hills, then break down rendering them useless, you just wasted tons of metal, rubber, plastic, chemicals, and glass, all extracted from our one planet to create a heaping pile of junk. Finally, did I mention that I come from a family of teachers? Anyway, I'm voting N-O, no, on all three propositions. Thank you. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so, oh, yeah. Kelly Boyko, and it is uh, on Zoom. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm a resident. Can I speak while it's uh, there's a law? There's uh, a, a sign up sheet that will take place, but while we're waiting, we may just go to the next name and come back okay. to, to Kelly. Um, Anita Graff. Thank you. We need a graph here. Okay. Maddie Tomato. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Maddie Termato. I'm an Ithaca homeowner, as well as a New York State certified high school teacher. I've been hearing from many ICSD teachers who say they are afraid if we don't pass this budget, they could lose their jobs or not receive their promised pay increases. I call BS on every person responsible for perpetuating this fear tactic. Here's a novel idea. How about we pay our teachers what they're worth and slash the salaries or positions of the top eight administrators whose income is way out of line with the other school districts? <laughs> Homeowners are being accused of not caring about the children or education, even though many of us are teachers, some of whom have dedicated their lives to educating children. Unlike the top brass who seem to be in this for the money, 
sure would be nice if we could get what we're paying for instead of having four failing schools. I thank you for your time. Um, Drew uh, Raman. Drew Raman here. Lee Rogers. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? Speak a little differently than what you've been hearing all the facts and figures. I'm not a facts and figures person, but I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to be speaking a little differently. Um, I'm from a working class family. We represent several unions. The New York State Nurses Association, Wisconsin Firefighters Association, International Seamen's Union, the Teamsters Union, Actors' Equity Association, and the Screen Actors Guild. So, true to my family history, when my niece's sink was leaking, she went online to learn how to fix it herself. Now she's engaged to this lovely guy, I love him. He's from a wealthy family. He advised her to just throw money at the problem. What's the big deal? Well, I'll tell you what the big deal is. If you throw money at a problem and that's all you do, you won't know what's wrong when things break and you won't know how to fix it. Well, this district is broken. And the school board is asking the few who pay property taxes in Ithaca to throw our money at their problem. The problem that ignores the waste, mismanagement, unfairness, the top heavy overpaid administration. Throwing money at the problem so they don't have to do the hard work of keeping tabs and saying no on those managing the school district. Now it's up to us to tell the ICSD with our votes that we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. Vote no on all three props on May 21st and demand they do the job that we pay them for. Thank you. We have Drew Brahman. Um, Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, 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 we can. Okay. My name is Drew Brayman. I'm actually a recent resident on Boswick Road, town of Enfield. Thanks for the time to speak this evening. I do appreciate the difficulty that the board has in going through your budget process. I've worked in finance for some 30 years, including nonprofits, governments, manufacturing, and a number of other organizations. Unfortunately, I've seen many of them take the easy way out, which I think this speaker just before me alluded to. It's not easy to say no. In the last five years, I've done some research and we've seen a student population decrease in the Ithaca School District of over 6%. At the same time, we've seen the school bus district budget increase over 25%. So when you look at what we're spending per student, that's over a 36% increase per student. I don't know about each of you on the school board or the administrators, but I know my home budget, I'm not bringing in 36% more than I was five years ago. I appreciate that you've taken a 12% proposal and gotten it down to 8% levy. Unfortunately, that's still increasing taxes per student over 40% in the last five to six years. To me, that's incredible. I have not seen any other business that's allowed their expenses to grow over 40%. In Ithaca and Tompkins County, we have a serious problem with affordable housing. Property taxes are a key component. I feel that we'd be irresponsible as taxpayers to vote this budget in and keep affordable housing away from many of the people who want to live and work in Tompkins County. Lastly, I implore that the school board in your publications, you mentioned 
and you highlight a decrease in the tax rate, that's really, in my opinion, very misleading as the increase in the tax levy overrides that. And truly the tax rate, when you look at the median home, according to the Tompkins County, has gone from 249,000 in 2023, up over 40% to 300,000 this current year. That's the median home value. So to equal those taxes, you want a tax rate decrease of 40%. So if you're advertising the tax rate decrease, please be very transparent in that um, publication. And that's what you're doing. In summary, I'd just like to say, I think we need to make some hard decisions and we've hired you guys to make those hard decisions. Please say no, I'm going to say no. Thank you for the time. Kelly Boyko is also on Zoom. She Kelly Boyko. Oh, she doesn't want to speak. Okay. okay. Uh, Kay Minix. Hello, Kay Minix, West Hill. Here's my reality check. When I moved to Ithaca 25 years ago, I thought I had found a great fit. A small city, beautiful scenery, a renowned university, progressive thinkers. It worked well until I retired and had to squeeze my life into a fixed income. Today, staying in one's home is as financially challenging as buying it. I now worry about how to pay for a new furnace or replacement appliances. I'm forced to critically look at where my money is going and why. New York State is number one in the country for school funding, and our district is one of the biggest spenders in the state. With pandemic relief dried up, school districts have been warned to monitor cost growth and manage budgets. Not so in Ithaca, where the proposed budget is 6.5% above the New York State legal tax cap. Heavy administrative expenses, unfunded state mandates, small class sizes, expanded facilities, all are paid not by the government, not by Cornell, and not by the army of developers who strike tax abatement sweetheart deals, but by the small 37% base of property owners here in Ithaca. In the past 10 years, the school budget has increased 50%. We are a public education system acting like a private school for Cornell bound students. So here's the reality, my reality. Ithaca will become a one dimensional community restricted to those who can pay whatever is asked. It will not be multi-generational. It will be six-figure folks paying for children of Cornell faculty and staff to receive a private school education. I'm urging everyone I know, young and old, to vote no on May 21st to the whole budget. Let's keep Ithaca diverse. Thank you. Jim Meehan. Hi, my name is Jim Meehan. I'm a homeowner, um, um, a retiree on a fixed income. So um, this weekend, there was a story in the TV news about how all school districts are struggling with reducing expenses uh, while they're dealing with the loss of COVID aid but not ICSD. To quote our um, ICSD superintendent in the, in the Ithaca Times a while back, many other schools are reducing staff and programming, which he believes he will avoid with, with this year's proposed budget. We're going to absorb the loss of significant federal and state aid. Absorbing the loss of federal funds without reducing expenses, how does one do that? 
ICSD appears to be operating a private academy under the vestiges of a public school. Of course, ICSD doesn't have a private endowment to fund the difference. However, Ithaca is a university town and Cornell has a significant private endowment. But neither the school board nor the city of Ithaca has the political willpower nor political capital to force Cornell to fairly fund the ICD, ICSD school system. So how do we fund the loss of COVID aid without reducing COVID expenses? To quote the superintendent again, he said that the school district did not, if the school district did not increase the tax levy, they would be faced with a $9 million in budget reductions. He emphasized the effects on the community if ICSD did not override the tax cap this year. Aren't homeowners part of this community? If we increase the tax levy by over $9 million, who pays the tax levy? Two thirds of the property in Tompkins County is tax exempt with Cornell the largest tax exempt entity. The remaining property owners, which includes me, pays 100% of the tax levy. This school board appears reluctant to reduce expenses. To quote the ICSD superintendent again, reduction means eliminating programs. That's people, that's a significant shift. That's not keeping up with our contractual obligations. Isn't there an obligation to provide affordable housing in Ithaca? I cannot support this budget and I cannot support any school board incumbent who votes for this budget. Thank you. Uh, Lee Sue Bailey. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm a brain injury survivor, so please be patient. <laughs> I probably will stumble. I want to stress that this is the first time ever that I attend a school board meeting or a hearing. Normally, I just pay my taxes and keep my head down. I no longer able to keep paying because homeowners now are just cash machine for poor management. We're sitting ducks yep. until we go out and vote no. This year's thoughtless increase is the result of not voting no last year. Enough is enough. A line needs to be drawn to demand proper management and common sense. ICSD should focus on education only and stop being everything for everyone, all at taxpayers' expense. There are many other social support agencies in Ithaca and none of which is supported by tech, a property tax. I refuse to get priced out of my own home to overspending and poor management by ICSD. I don't see ICSD helping me buying my house 20 some years ago. Help with mortgage, maintaining my house responsibly or will even help me to move out. Yet, you're thoughtless, yet you shamelessly feel so entitled and happily force people out of their homes. All you offer is empty talk, but no positive test scores or transparent 
financial data to prove. I strongly urge the board, I mean, in closing, I strongly urge the board to, to stop enabling this craziness. Thank you. Michael Hayes. Honored board members, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I rise to speak in strong opposition to the budget as passed by your board and urge all homeowners and taxpayers to vote no to this budget, the capital program request, and additional buses with the election held on 21st May. Straighten out your house first using last year's budget amount, or if you insist on not doing that, on the contingency budget when a budget fails a second time this year. Throwing more money at a problem that is clearly not understood how to solve is a demonstration of a lack of understanding, skill, and intellectual capability to do your job of the administrators. To quote another who I read recently and who is spot on, Look at what the superintendent and the school board have done to our schools and our students. The paper yesterday brings us timely news that the New York State Education Department has rescinded the good standing of two additional district schools as of 13 May, both of them are middle schools. I did not know there were already two other schools that had previously had good standing rescinded until yesterday. That is one third of our schools failing the New York State Education Department standards out of public view. Your cumulative failures in execution, the buck stops with you, the board who is fiduciarily responsible to the taxpayers and to the law and to the superintendent who clearly doesn't know how to run a school and create programs where students pass. A failing grade is defined as 64% or less. With four out of 12 schools having lost their good standing, that's 66.6, .6, about as close as you can get to an F. How exactly is an additional $10 million tax levy this year, um, which is an effective rate of $19 per thousand dollars evaluation when you figure in the assessment increase. Um, how is that budget going to fix the growing failure of the previous $17.48 million since 2019 or the requested total of $25.5 million since 2019, when test scores have continued to decline through that entire period of time. We'll let you finish. Thank you. This simply will not work. We're throwing good money after bad. The proof provided by NYSED is non-functioning policies creating substandard outcomes in education of our students, your students, put in place by the present administration and blessed by the board. I cannot get an answer to a pertinent question, which is how much money did the school district receive in ESSER and GEER temporary COVID relief, and where did that money go? All of your additional- Mr. Hayes, my apologies, in summary. Okay. No, no, I'm saying a last statement, but I just wanted to make sure we're running. 
in, in summary, to summarize the last statement? Sure. During COVID, this school district and everyone in New York State that I'm aware of received COVID money, temporary COVID money. And it was designed to be temporary. And it's called ESSER, which is the federal component. And the state gave it out as grants, and that's called GEER funds. No one will answer my questions, written or in person, as to how much was received each year and what it was spent on. The guidance board specifically states it should only go to temporary expenses until the end of COVID, not creating new programs and long-funded positions that obviously won't have funding when it ends. Looking at this budget and looking at school districts that are grappling with their difficulties at the end of the COVID funding, school districts that use it as temporary money aren't having much problem. Plus or minus 2%, they're fine. School districts that use COVID money incorrectly look like this. Large multi-million dollar deficits trying to pay for something that wasn't an issue previously. The, the uh, school district administration needs to be reorganized and functional policies need to replace the present policies. I believe no new money should be provided until the pressure of scarcity weeds out the errors and the creators of the errors. Teachers need corrected policy changes that assure discipline in their classrooms can be achieved in order to create a learning environment that means replace or reinstating things like suspension, timeout rooms for disruptive students, so that the rest of the class can learn rather than one person distract the entire class for an hour and lower everybody's test scores. Last sentence, Mr. Hayes, please. Consequences for students that administrators must exist and must be followed. Vote no for all three propositions. Thank you very much. Again, folks, please know that the intent is not to stifle conversation, but in equity that we said three minutes per person. So I will be trying to keep folks to that limit. I just want to make sure we know that in advance. Uh, Moira. Uh, Deborah Justice. Hi, thank you for fitting us in. My name is Deb Justice. My son and I live over on Second Street. And I wanted to say Can something. To oh, sorry. Yes, I just wanted to say something today because he's not quite three. But in looking at the school budget, I'm paying less for him to go to Montessori school than it seems like the school district is paying for students. And I was a little confused about that. Um, you know, and we all just got re Don't grab that. Thank you. <laughs> and we all just got reassessed. And my property did go up by about 20%, which, you know, I know that that's a different conversation, but that's a lot of money. And I'm a single parent and I work full time. So I'm also noticing, you know, as other people have been saying, there's a lot of administration, um, people who are making scales more money than I do working at Cornell full time. And I do understand that Cornell should absolutely be contributing more, but that's a longer term conversation that's not going to solve this year's problems. <laughs> um, I had another point. <laughs> yeah, I got <laughs> Oh, and yes, the um, the report that just came out today saying that the school that we're zoned for is now like decredited or whatever with New York State, that does not make me feel good about sending him to BJM. Um, so, whoa, hey, hi, this is not that kind of poll. Um, so anyway, that was kind of just what I had to say. So thank you very much. Ronald Boers.
My name is Ronald Bors, and I have been paying Ithaca School District taxes for over 50 years. With this budget, you have achieved the milestone. Unfortunately, that milestone is fiscal lunacy. You propose this massive budget knowing full well that the average citizen is staggering under the burden of the crushing inflation we have endured for the past few years with no end in sight. It is particularly galling that you attempted to mislead us in yesterday's proposed budget mailing by highlighting the decrease in the tax rate, which is minuscule compared to the huge increase caused by our assessed property values, which we are trying to scoop. The final straw is contained in Proposition 2, where you ask us to improve, to approve, up to four new electric school buses. You apparently are oblivious to the terrible reliability problems experienced by our local TCAT electric bus fleet. There may be a time in the future when electric buses are reliable enough to consider a purchase. However, that time has not yet come. I will be voting no to all three propositions. Wayne O'Brien. Hi, everybody. My name is Wayne O'Brien, and I've been an Ithaca resident for oh, 20 years or so. But I'm a former school teacher, a high school science teacher. I've taught every science that you can possibly put in a school at that time. I taught in Wisconsin, Illinois, Colorado, and Maryland. So I think I know something about educating kids. I want to tell you two stories in case you've been bored so far about what you've heard. Maybe the stories will wake you up. One, my father, he was a middle class, lower middle class guy, but he taught me a great deal about fiscal responsibility. So the story goes, I would bet everybody here except very few remember Ben Franklin 5 and 10 store. Anybody? I got one, I got two. All right. You could go in there for five cents and 10 cents and get all kinds of good stuff. So I'm about seven years, eight years old. And I was just getting into model planes and, you know, plastic stuff and all that good stuff that kids love. So my dad and I went to Ben Franklin. He wanted to go for some reason. And he promised me, he said, Wayne, he says, I know that you really love models and I'm willing to buy you a model. He says, but there comes a little catch to it. It must be $3 or less. Now, $3 was a lot of money back then. Because I'm really old, let's see. <laughs> so there was a, a long time ago, but three dollars was it. So I go over, you know, you kind of run into the store because you got all of that money to spend. So you rush in, you go to the model place, and you look at it. No, three dollars ain't gonna give you what I want, you see. So, but I found one, I found one for, for seven dollars that I really, really wanted. So I take the model and I go to my dad and I said dad please let me have this he looks down and he said Wayne you're going to learn a lesson right now he says never buy what you can't afford to pay for now that lesson has stood me in great stead personal finances I'm pretty well off largely because of that lesson my dad taught me Second story, when I came to Ithaca, I became a long-term sub at Boynton End Junior High, or they don't call them junior highs anymore. My, my age is showing here. They call them middle schools. Okay, so I was responsible for teaching five classes of eighth graders, uh, science, just general science. And I struggled mightily to make sure 
that enough kids got B's and A's so I wouldn't be called to the principal's office. That probably doesn't shock you, or maybe it does, because that tells me something. When I finally left there, I learned something after the end of my semester there, that, did you know this? At that time, fully one third of Boynton Junior, I'm sorry, middle school kids were honors and above. Now, that was a head scratcher to me because I know I only taught average, whatever that means, kids. So it kind of befuddled me. How could one third of the kids that I taught be honor rolls? Then it hit me because I felt obligated and pressured to make sure that they had B's and A's. That's going on right now in your school. In your school. Grade inflation is rampant in the country. And it reflects in the standardized tests. It reflected then and it reflects now. Say no to this budget and let's use the money that you do get to help improve students education not to buy new athletic fields etc cetera, etc cetera. thank you very much mike and nadine bennett one more time order mike and nadine bennett oh Oh, no, okay, thank you. All right, uh, Michael Brown. Um, well, I wanna say thank you for having this event and allowing us to speak. Um, Please speak into the microphone, my Sure, yeah. I um, won't turn this into a stand-up routine, but um i went to ithaca high school i went to caroline and then i went to dewitt then i went to ithaca high school i took spanish in a classroom up there i had a nosebleed at a desk right here because i was so stressed out about a calculus test <laughs> um and i went away for grad school and then i moved back here and i have um two kids that are going to be going to school here as well <clears throat> Um, I really valued the education that I got at Ithaca High School and or throughout my uh, time here. Um, and I, uh, my kids are going to go here, and I want them to get a good ed get education, um, and I want every other kid to get a good education as well. And I'm willing to pay for it. I'm willing to spend. Um, it is a top priority, and I especially want to support the teachers Um you know, when I think back to high school and having gone to graduate school as well, some of the best teachers I ever had were at Ithaca High School. Um, and I really do not like this position that I am being put in, um, where I'm having to think about the budget and thinking about teachers and whether or not some of their positions are going to get cut. And I have serious concerns, I guess, about the process here. You know, this is my first time dealing with this. I just moved back and bought a house had spent a lot of money on it because of the housing market in this town. Um, and my house got reassessed and I got this yesterday and I don't understand why I'm getting this a week before the vote. Um, and it says the proposed budget includes a tax levy increase and we anticipate a decrease in the tax rate. And I just don't understand why, um, I feel like we're being negotiated in bad faith here. Uh, it's so misleading. Um, so I, I'm, it pains me. I'm seriously considering voting no on this budget. Um, I'm not convinced yet, um, but I'm very concerned for folks on limited income um, and folks trying to afford to live in this town, including my family. And I'm concerned about eventually getting priced out. Um, and I guess I need to see more justification for why this budget is where it is and why this, why are we being proposed with such a substantial increase? And I'm very concerned about the news of these uh, poorly performing schools as well. So thank you.
from John, uh, Joe Lonsky. My name is Joe Lonsky. I uh, perform in front of thousands of people with a mic just like this, but I'm very scared right now. This is a little different. What am I doing? Oh, it, it's got it's a compressor on it. All right. Um, anyway, uh, the biggest factor in a, in a child's uh, success later in life is, is what? It's It's their home. It's their home. It's their, it's their parents. I, I, wanted, I want to be the good guy for, for you right now and tell you the board not to worry if you have to cut a couple teachers, if you have to cut, if you have to cut some things and you know they, they can't have karate, they can't have sailboarding lessons. Oh, well, they don't have those, but they have, they have a lot of extracurricular stuff. And you know something? The kids are going to be fine. Or they're not. What you do here, you know, it's, it's a very small part of what they're going to learn in life. We live in the information age. They get so much information from the internet. They get so much information. Most of what I have learned to, to make my way in the world, I learned after school. But, and I want to say, to, so I want you guys to relax and just, and just make the numbers right. Because it, it's in the, longer, in the longer run, the kids are going to be better off if they can afford to live. And to people out here, it's simple math. I always vote no on a school budget if it increases more than wages increase. I have for my whole life. There, there have been budgets that I have voted yes on, or I just stayed home. But whenever it's over the wage, it look, it's, a fro it's what they call a frog in the pot number. And the pot's boiling right now. And, and I, I ran last year on one item, and one in five people voted for me and it was to reduce spending. Did anybody remember my name? No. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, I'm not going to take longer than three minutes. I just want to say that you need, for your ch children's sake, to vote no on school budgets. And Cornell is never, never going to pay as long as you're happily voting yes. They're never going to pay. Thank you very much. Is it, is it Sonny Smith? Uh, Jim Gilmore? Can you please use the microphone even if you yeah, talk? Uh, but the people online can't hear you. That's what we're oh. worried about. My apologies. And we have a recording. Oh, okay. You can still turn to the audience with, with your microphone. I'll turn around. <laughs> you can hold the mic. Yeah, hold the mic. Hold the mic. Turn. Okay, there you go. I want to thank Adam for running. Uh, he's my neighbor. Um, and, he, you know, he wrestles with his kids and his dog and his family and I'm glad to be here. I uh, wanted to come down. Ron Boers called me and asked me to come down. Uh, Ron is <clears throat> my neighbor. And uh, a couple, uh, I don't know, decade plus ago, he helped with the Village of Cuga Heights budget. Did a great job. Uh, he's very uh, logical, very intelligent, and uh, reasonable. So I wanted to come down and support Ron. I was very encouraged when uh, Eileen Granger, I don't know her new name, I'm sorry, if she has one, um, removed the storage units that had been at the Village of Cuga Heights uh, School for several, several years, and at quite an expense, I suspect. Um, she got in there, and within a few weeks, she removed those. And to me, that represents uh, an inability of management to to control costs at our school system. Just those uh, those storage units being removed, and then the, now there's grass planted there. And um, 
I imagine that's several hundred dollars a month that the school system is no longer paying for storage that probably didn't make a lot of sense to a new principal who came into the school. And she came in under duress, I understand, from the teachers who were working in a situation previously that was intolerable and uh, very difficult uh, situation uh, to, to uh, teach our kids. So I guess I'm being timed and I know there's some sort of strange alarm that's gonna go off any minute. So I just wanna say that this is real, school board. Um, I've been a property owner for 33 years and uh, this is this is real. I hope that you uh, have the courage and the intelligence to ask our um, school management to uh, take a request back by you guys and gals to uh, to cut the budget. It's just too much. And um, yeah, uh, I'm married to a teacher. She's more conservative than I am, but she's also better at managing our home budget. And uh, um, yeah, I, I, I echo the sentiments of everyone who's spoken and also electric buses technologically are just not, we're not ready for them because uh, they're not dependable and they're very expensive. Thank you. Kelly Teeter. I want you to make sure everybody's listening. Everybody good? Okay. <laughs> um, it's easier to take the phone. Okay. Please forgive my device. I didn't have time to print this and I needed an outline. Um, but good evening. Um, I'm Kelly. I'm here as a former teacher in ICSD. Um, I was very proud to teach here at IHS, um, a parent and a taxpayer. And I'm here to speak against the proposed increase in the budget. Um, some slightly different angles here. I am here to represent multiple ICSD employees, fellow parents, and fellow taxpayers um, with what I'm about to say. So I was going to request that my time cap be extended as my voice represents so many others tonight all of whom were concerned about coming to say these points. I will begin with some acknowledgments. Uh, yes, our student and teacher well-being is paramount. Yes, the problem of how our district is funded is a problem. I understand that school taxes are part of a larger conversation potentially involving Cornell and Albany. And I would also like to challenge the following with you. Continually raising the budget beyond taxpayer means is not the only way to ensure our students and teachers are cared for and compensated properly. We should not admit that tax increases are a burden for taxpayers and ask for them anyways. We are slowly changing who can live here and the overall affordability of Ithaca, and that is a huge problem, especially when you state that your district values are diversity, equity, inclusion. Voting down this budget should not mean that instructional positions will be cut, paid less, or fail to be given proper raises. It is downright inappropriate that two weeks ago, I heard several teachers speak out about their fears of earning enough income and they're holding multiple jobs. Taxpayers should not be made to feel as wholly responsible for the well-being of our students and staff. So I have three points to go over with you, given all that. One, myself, and everyone I'm representing and coming tonight are asking for clear and transparent data justifying the number of leadership positions and their salaries. I know this may be difficult to hear. I, I know this may be difficult to hear, but please, please hear me out. I see that there are many administrators and non-instructional positions at IACSD who make over $100,000 a year. Are their positions and salaries justified by actual data directly correlating with student attendance and positive academic outcomes because we should be looking at more than grades for student success? I wanna see the kids show up. I wanna see the kids participate. Mm -hmm. So it can be hard to measure these things, I understand. How do these numbers compare to other districts of comparable size and student body needs across the state and across the nation? 
Here are some examples that I and the people I'm coming on behalf of are concerned about. High school principals across the nation with a master's degree earn a median annual income of about $107,000 and about 95 for those with a bachelor's degree. At Ithaca High School, thank you so much for allowing me some extra time. A few more time. I, I really am representing so many people. I, I, they have small yeah. children, small children, yes, okay. So at Ithaca High respectfully, School- Respectfully everyone, I am going to try to let folks speak, but again, there are a number of folks who are trying to speak as well. I, I know, I, I apologize to everybody. Maybe I might get your points, let's see. Um, so at Ithaca High School alone, we employ one principal and five associate principals, all earning over the nation's average principal income. And then, I know this is also hard to hear, there is the superintendent's salary set to increase with this budget proposal from 249 to about 269. Per NYSED's data, the salary is closer to 381 when you add the categories of, I quote, salary, benefits, and other. Can you justify this cost set to increase, no less, in a very transparent, data-driven way? We also have a deputy superintendent as well as five other central leadership positions. I am in no way criticizing the work they currently do, just pointing out that they all make more than the national averages for their positions. Yet, we have four schools now cited by New York State for poor academic performance. So my action item for everything I just said, I would like you to outline to us how you can actually justify with data each non-instructional position and their salary. And you may have to make cuts and consolidations here when appropriate. Point two, how we value teaching staff. I would like to call into question the pay gap between administrative and instructional salaries and how this fails to align with the mission and values we claim to have in this district. From the data I am able to find, our teachers make anywhere from forty to $70,000 a year. Uh, I won't tell you what I started. <laughs> Many of our non-instructional positions earn more than double this amount. If the teachers are the heart of your operation, they need to be compensated and valued as such. That does not mean... <laughs> This part is difficult too. That does not mean that everyone's salary increases. It means that you don't squeeze our community. Instead, you directly demonstrate the value and importance of your staff by evening out the pay to be more equitable. Isn't this one of the biggest problems in our world after all? So my action item for you, given all that, item two is you lower at the very least cap administrative salaries and raise teacher salaries to, so to show that one line of work is not less important or significant than another. There are proposals in other states with how to do this. I'll cut that part out for now. Number three, my last point, thank you so much. Uh, the role of leadership during difficult times. I want to state my last point in support of upholding our mission, vision, and culture of love, I quote. I want you to therefore bring it to your attention that being a leader means you do the best for your people and you are responsible for students and teachers and taxpayers alike. You are in a position to create re real change where we need it most. You make sure that the very purpose of this district, student learning, is possible. And that means so much more than it appears at first glance. It means thinking about every aspect of a student's and teacher's well-being in their lives here so that they can show up at school with their needs met, ready to learn. You want to engage, educate, and empower, but if students and staff can't afford good homes here, access good nutrition here, afford reliable transportation here, and spend quality time outside of school with their families and community that can afford to live here, you aren't allowing your mission a chance. I want you to make sure that you are careful in what you ask of our community who support you and attend your schools. A closing comment, please. Yes. I want you to ask in your positions of leadership, not what you can gain, but whom you can serve. So here is my action item for that last part. I ask you to rework the budget again as not to increase taxes for our community right now. I want you to help us in efforts to organize or lead the movement to change how the district is funded in the meantime. Do not cite this as the problem without joining the community in solving it. Otherwise, it's going to be the same problem for years to come. Thank you for your time, and I would ask that you wholly consider the three action items I have brought up tonight in order to demonstrate your true care of the 6,000 plus thinkers, their teachers, and their families, 
even if it means making changes that are very selfless and difficult and unprecedented, best leadership decisions often are. Uh, that is the last person that we have that has signed up to speak. Excuse me. Um, Paul John Crutchfield, I didn't come until uh, about three minutes ago. Excuse yeah. me. My name is John Crutchfield. Also, Eric Prince. Um, that I thought, Eric, I thought you were going to speak at the board meeting, not the budget hearing. Oh, Eric. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. And John. Too. And John, too. Oh, okay. To be clear, yeah. if your comments are budget related. Didn't realize. This. So we're yes, going this to is the, this have is, a public comment for yes. the regular board meeting. This is part of the budget hearing. There, there will be public comment at the board meeting, which is going to follow after this. Okay, thank you. Yes, can you state your name, please? And had, did you sign up or you're asking to speak now? My name is Vivek Ayer. Uh, my daughters have been attending ICSD schools for the last 10 years. Um, since I moved to Ithaca, I voted in every single school board election, except for one, when I was traveling overseas. Now, I wanted to give you a slightly different perspective. Um, I went to a private school in India, which produced a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Chandrasekhar. Uh, there is a flagship NASA space telescope named after him. Now, my school was small by U.S. standards. Tuition was about $25 per month. We sat on wooden benches with no seat cushions. We had one ceiling fan, <clears throat> no air conditioning in a city with 100 degree summers and 95% humidity. That ceiling fan would often not run because the power supply, this was during India's socialist heydays, was unreliable. But we all learned. We had great students who are well-placed throughout the world. Now I have been paying taxes here without complaining to the board for almost 11 years. But I'm here today because of two reasons. One, the weakening of discipline. And two, the dilution of academic standards. As compared to my high school, which charged $25 per month for tuition, ICSD is spending an insane amount of money. And for what? Underperforming schools adjacent to one of the best universities in the world. Cornell or selfish taxpayers or voters are not to blame. There is no shortage of money here. There is a deficiency in leadership. Now, this is going to sound harsh, but I hope that changes next week. Thank you. Now is the opportunity for any board responses, should there be any board responses. <laughs> yes, you were. My name, is, sorry. my name is Leslie Saye, and I just wanted to say that I grew up in the school district here. My mother was a teacher, and even back then, she couldn't afford to rent a house in Ithaca because of the salary of the teachers. What I don't understand is why, when there's a budget problem, the, the teachers are the ones who are threatened with their jobs instead of administrators. It doesn't make any sense to me. If this is a school board that is wanting their children, the children of this district, to be educated in the way that I think we all do, why that there isn't an, a, a commitment to making sure that the teachers are paid well and that they're not that, that they're not in fear of their jobs. The other thing that I wanted to say is because of my experience in Ithaca when I was growing up. I moved back here a year ago. I bought a, t a house downtown in Ithaca that I could barely afford, and I might not be able to stay there. This is my chosen place to retire, and I might not be able to stay there more than another year or two if the taxes keep on going up. I'm absolutely for the teachers. I just don't understand where all of this money is coming from. I mean, where it's supposed to come from and where it's going. I think that transparency is absolutely a must and reworking the budget is also a good idea. Thank you. 
Leslie. Leslie, could you spell your last name, please? Yes. Folks who have attended previous board meetings know that I use silence as a form of just to let things sit before we transition to the next. And so that's what I'm doing. Dr. Tripp is going to be providing our first board response, if I'm correct. I'm offering. Please, Dr. Tripp. All right. As many of you know, I agree with much of what you said tonight. And I think if you'll stay tuned, you'll see some changes. Uh, the wheels of school government move slowly, but they do move. I think there are a number of us on the board who share your concerns about administrative costs, who share your concerns about excessive spending, and would like to see some changes made. I believe there are also a number of people on the board who would be in support of joining the movement to get Cornell to pay their fair share. We will be working at least to get a vote on some of those issues here in the upcoming few weeks. You say you'd like to see the budget reworked. That will happen if you vote down this budget. Okay? We sent the budget, we being the school board, sent you the budget so we could see what the voters think. May 21st will be our opportunity to know how you feel. I thank all of you who come tonight. I'm proud to be part of a community where people care enough to come out and speak their minds. Thank you. Any other board responses? It takes a time. It takes time. Folks are trying to figure out who's going to speak at what point in time, but I'm certain you'll hear more board responses. Um, and I often speak too soon, so I was trying to wait. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to speak too soon again because I don't like silence. <laughs> um, sorry. I'm sorry. I am Aaron Croyle. I'm a board member. I'm a parent. I'm a taxpayer in this district, and I too feel it. And I've said it before. I feel it deeply. It's difficult. I appreciate everyone who's coming here. Um, the, the budget process is not easy and it's confusing. And um, even being on the board for, I'm in my second term now. It's, it's a lot to take in each year. So I appreciate you all coming. I wish we would have had this feedback in January, but I don't expect people to attend every meeting in January or December. I get that it's now where we have to pay attention because these conversations were being had. Um, I, I think the most, I, I just, I really just want to stress after, after hearing you all just a couple things. Okay. And again, I, I'm not disagreeing with anything that you say. I just want to point out that the average cost per student is an average cost. Okay. In my own home with my three kids, I have a student who is one of those ones that takes the average way high. He's a very expensive kid and he's worth every penny, okay? And then, thank you. And then I have another student who's not, like he's, I have no idea what the, his cost would be, but he is totally low maintenance, no interventions. And I have one that's middle of the line that probably as things go on might be that 35 average, okay? It's not a cookie cutter sort of district, and that's something to be proud of. But I'm not saying that we don't hear what you're saying either. Um, when it comes to the capital project, I think one thing that's really important to understand, and I'm not saying how you should vote, but just that money is for our buildings, which are aging, okay? And when you walk into our buildings, if you go to Enfield, if you go to Northeast, it's not just, um, we're not just talking needs of paint jobs, okay? There, there are cracks in the building. There are playgrounds that are like falling apart. There, there are rooms that just, it just feels lousy to be in there because it just feels so old. 
And so um, I, I just think it's important to remember that those funds that we are asking and could very well be asking for far less, right? If this goes no, they are reimbursed by the state. So part of the reason we as a board really consider those is I think we get, and Amanda can correct me if I'm wrong, is it 58 cents to the dollar reimbursed? So that's why those capital fund projects, the capital improvement plans are important to keep having on the ballot. It's not frivolous. It is the fact that that is money that we will get back from the state. And that's really important to understand. Please, please, please. If, if I don't know what the argument was. I'm not asking you to, to approve 125 million. I'm just saying that that money is reimbursed. And it just, I have read uh, please, 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 please. I, I understand. I understand the board is responding. We've had, we've had two. part of the reason why that capital project money is important. Okay. Why we do that. Okay. The specifics of it are questions for our administrators. Okay. We are, we are past participation okay. we are on to board responses so I'm, I'm trying to empathize, empathize with you okay and i'm just explaining why why that why capital improvement funds are important i'm i get the frustration with the electric buses i don't know what fines we get if we don't follow through with that mandate i'm not quite sure okay hum, humbly folks humbly folks you've asked us to to you, you, my apologies, right? You've asked us to listen, which I think we've all done intently. It's time for board responses. We'll ask the same. If folks do have disagreements or want to have additional conversation, every board member's information is posted on the site, email, phone number, et cetera. Unfortunately, we are not taking questions during this time. Ms. Croyle, are you? I feel like I'm clear in the room mm -hmm. and I, I want to like bring Joe back to give me some advice. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I find, and I, I'm just gonna end because I don't wanna shove my foot in my mouth farther, <laughs> but I also wanna thank the folks that did have a little humor because it helps for me to not cry. This is very hard. Thank you. Karen, Karen, your wood, please. Yes, so thank you all for coming and thank you to my colleagues. It was, um, it was very disturbing for me to hear, we can't afford to solve national systemic problems on the back of a few taxpayers. First of all, we're not trying to solve national systemic problems. We're trying to make sure within our vision and mission for this district, we're dealing with some systemic issues here that are a result of national issues too. And so our budget is de definitely working towards that. And it was also disturbing to hear that, oh, we need to reinstate suspension and timeout rooms and all. And what you're saying to me is that we're not looking at equitable education. We're not looking at inclusive education where students there, we don't have the special or the other rooms that were from like 20 plus years ago where inclusive education. We're given opportunity for students to participate in different clubs and different um, languages and, and so forth. So in looking at the budget, we're looking at all aspects. And it would be appreciative for me that um, we definitely have a lot of frequently asked questions where we go through and break down things thoroughly on our website. But it seems like at times my impression or my interpretation is that we'd rather hear from social media or other things and then talk about things and ex try to advance those conversations. So um, um, last week, Wednesday, Tompkins County, assess um, Tompkins County presented their budget. And unfortunately, I didn't see a large crowd out <laughs> at that meeting. It would be good if we definitely, as homeowners, because I am one, to, and I was affected by the assessment that we do make sure our voices are heard where that's concerned. And one thing I've learned over as being second year on the board, this is my first term and through some of the New York State training that I attended, it's not only Ithaca City School District that is having 
challenges in employing educators. It's across the state, it's across this nation too. So it's not just us here. And I think there was some comment that alluded to that. And I want to remind everyone that, um, as I always said, we had three pandemics in 2020. We had the health, we had racial, and we had political. And we learned from things. We learned from COVID. And we know that although the COVID funding may have gone away, the students and their well-being, the staff and their well-being haven't. We still need to make sure our funds are going towards that. This past weekend, as a result of hearing the community at one of our community conversations back in April, we extended an invitation to the community members to come out and see the Department of Transportation on Saturday from nine to 10 um, to see one of the areas that we're looking to improve with the proposal number three. And there were a few, probably a handful of community members. And I thank you all who did come out and they had some riveting questions, which hopefully we were able to address. And one, one of our workers, our um, supervisors, managers at the Department of Transportation stated and showed us the room where they do training and how they're going to try to fit 100 people into that small room. And it's, we've outgrown that area that was built back in the 1960s. So we're looking to improve and the well-being of our staff to make sure that they have the facility that they need. Too. So that 125 million in proposition number three is up to 125 million. Not let's just go out and get it right now, but we would have to come back to the voters with information. Mm -hmm. And and we always say the school district, I know administration and staff always say the less talk um, feature online to throughout the year. If you think you're not hearing from us, you think we're not doing what we should be doing as a school district, let's talk because we do read the let's talk comments and our staff tries to respond to all of the let's talk comments too. So I, I thank you for um, continuing to voice your concerns and your, yeah, your concerns and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Additional board member responses. More. Um, I always forget to use the microphone. <laughs> Try not to. Uh, so, as other people have said, this is difficult, um, and I may not be completely organized in my thoughts. I will say one thing that um, this, as other people have stated, uh, that the budget is developed over many, many months. And the original pr proposal, which we modified uh, a month ago, I guess, or, or several weeks ago, was developed before the preliminary assessments came out. And for many, many people, the jump in your assessments was unprecedented. And that was not anticipated by the people who were uh, developing the budget and those of us who uh, ultimately approved the budget. So that's one point. Uh, our uh, website under budget development has a wealth of information about specifics in the budget. And I think there will be more being added. Uh, some of the information there uh, is information uh, that has been misstated uh, in various places, including this evening. Like for instance, our, uh, our cost per pupil expenditure, which is below the state average by several thousand dollars. And, I, uh, and it has been this year's uh, county average has not been calculated yet, but for the last many years, Ithaca City School District's per, per, per pupil expenditure is below the count, has been below the county average. We've also heard information about teacher salaries. In fact, this year, the starting teacher's salary 
for a teacher with no experience and no credits beyond a BA is $51,241. And it will go up next year. And it has been the strategy for the last rounds of negotiations with teachers to increase teachers' salaries. And that is our goal going into negotiations a year from now. Uh, some information that is not yet on the website under frequently asked questions, but I'm hoping that it can be added because we've been hearing a lot and people have, have mentioned that they've been reading a lot about electric buses and particularly TCAT's experience. So when I read about that, and then I also heard people uh, expressing concern about electric buses, I went to someone who has worked extremely hard um, on issues of the district becoming carbon neutral. And he is a high school librarian, which means he's a researcher. And he's done a tremendous amount of researchers, research on the subject um, of how we can create a str strategic plan to become carbon neutral in ways that are good for the environment, but also ultimately will save the district money. So just a little bit of the information that he gave me about electric buses is one, TCAT purchased their buses from a company that went bankrupt. And since that bankruptcy, they have been unable to get parts. So they haven't been able to repair those buses. So they've had to sideline them. There are a number of companies that produce electric buses. And um, we have purchased from a company, and uh, correct me, if I'm wrong, how many electric buses do we currently have? Five. We have a bus fleet of 88 buses. Uh, the proposal number two is to add four more electric buses. And uh, we do have a mandate from the state to be fully electrified by 2025. But some of the... 35, excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah, I misspoke. Um, some of the information that I got from Armin is about how, so our electric buses are reported to be working very, very well. They are handling our conditions. And they're at this point a small part of our fleet. And if we purchase more this year, they will still be like 10% of our fleet. And that, over the life of an electric bus, research shows, and I'm hoping that we put this on the website, that an electric bus will save $2,000 to $4,000 a year in maintenance and, and associated costs. That's every single bus. Um, so that's information that I got from a researcher. And he has more that we'll post on the website. Uh, so I th think that's all I have to say right now. I do thank you all for coming. We really do hear you. Um, oh, I do have one more thing to say. You know, I, I understand when people think and see that we have uh, many administrators. I, I taught in this district for 25 years. I ta taught for a total of 35 years. And there was a time when I was teaching here uh, where I worked with many uh, administrators um, and in other schools where I've worked as well. I've worked with many administrators. And I often thought, what do they do? <laughs> Um, the fact is that, you know, whatever you think about how many administrators we have, to characterize them as doing it for the money and being lazy and not wanting to work. I can tell you I've been working with this team for nine years 
nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, somebody implied that they didn't want this, to. Uh, my apologies, folks. Oh. Right. My, my, you got to speak the truth then when you were speaking about it. Right. And part of what we're also responding to is the variety of emails that we receive, phone calls, et cetera. So I get it. You've asked us to listen. We have. We're asking you to do the same as we respond. As we respond. Garrick? Uh, I'm Garrick Blaylock. This is my first year on the board. It's a good year to start. Uh, let me first say thank you for, for coming out and for sharing your views. And this is difficult. I know it's difficult for you. And it's certainly difficult for us. I made a few comments at the last meeting. And uh, forgive me for those of you who are here. I'm going to repeat some of them. But I just want to break down some of the numbers and and think about the process by the, which the budget set. So to be clear, what this board does is propose a budget. We don't set a tax rate. We don't do assessments. We set a, a budget. The budget that we are putting for, forward to you next Tuesday is a 5% increase over the budget this year. Okay. Five point, I can give you an exact number, but Amanda, do you, if you want to correct me, but it's, um, huh? Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, 6.54. There were many versions going back and forth, but it's a 6.54% increase, okay? Just want to be sure everyone understands that. Thank you for correcting me. The increase in your tax bill for most of you is going to be much larger than 6.54%, all right? If... If your tax bill was going to go up 6.54%, I'm not sure everyone would be here tonight. You're here because your assessments have gone up. And in many cases, they've gone up. Please listen, please, please. I understand. It's difficult. Let, me, let, me, let me finish the sentence. Your tax bill is going to go up more than 6.54% because assessments went up, but they went up in a way that shifts the burden of taxes away from commercial properties and towards single family homeowners, right? If you look at the increase in the taxable land, it's 12%. And Amanda, I'm going to, there's a lot of numbers here and I'm speaking without notes. I'm going to invite Amanda to correct me if I get any of the numbers wrong, but uh, the average single family home went up about 25%. The overall value of assessed land went up about 12%. So if the average home went up 25% and the value of land overall went up 12, it tells you that there's another end of that spectrum. And that's mostly commercial property, which is in generally experiencing 0% growth in the assessment. The net result of that is a shift of the tax burden away from commercial properties towards single family homeowners. So although the increase in our budget is the 6.54%, the increase in the tax bill when it unrolls is more than 6.5%. And that causes pain. It especially causes pain for seniors on fixed incomes. I understand the pain. I'm a taxpayer too. It's a real problem. So one question you might ask of this board is why don't we come up with a budget that leaves you harmless so that your tax bill doesn't go up 6.54% or more, that it stays the same. So if you work backwards on that, realizing that, um, commercial properties didn't go up in assessment, we would need to lower the budget such that the tax rate per thousand dollars would go from 16.22 to 12.9. Does everyone follow me? If the effective tax rate was 12.9, the resulting budget for the school district would be 20% lower. Okay, so I just want to understand the choices that this board faces is a 20% reduction in expenditures to hold all single family homeowners harmless. So your bill doesn't go up at all. Okay, that's one choice, it is a 20% is a reduction in expenditures. The other choice is unfortunately because the way public finance in New York State works is to hit single family homeowners with a tax increase that's much greater than the 6.54% budget increase that we're putting forth to you. So. We have 
uh, tried to strike the balance. That is why the budget we're putting forward to you next Tuesday is about four, four million dollars less than the original budget. But the budget number was developed far in advance of the assessments coming out. And even knowing the information about the assessments, there's not a lot we can do about it in the short run. We do not have the ability to tax commercial properties and single family homeowners at different rates. You know, there's a lot of things that maybe could be done in the long run, but in the short run, that's the choice that we face. So I just wanna, you know, we understand the pain, the budget increase is 6.54%, but you're here and you're, you're you're concerned and you're rightly concerned because your tax bill is going to go up a lot more than that. It's unfortunately a little bit out of our hands given the public finance model of public education in New York, but that, that's where we are. So that's sort of point one. Uh, point two about the bond measure. Uh, just to be clear, we're asking for permission to borrow over the course of the next decade or so, 125 million. But I want to be clear that every one of those expenditures will be brought forth to the board, they will be debated, they will be discussed. What we're doing is, is asking for the permission to do that over the next 10 years, and here's why. Commodity prices go up, commodity prices come down, the availability of local construction labor goes up and goes down, and what we want our team to have is the flexibility to make investments in things like fixing roofs and uh, repairing playgrounds and things like that at the opportune time. If we do not have the bond measure, then when we see an opportunity to make a repair at a good value, we can't do it. We have to wait until the next May and put it forth to the voters. So what we wanna have is the permission in advance to take advantage of market forces such that we can get good deals on needed repairs like fixing leaky roofs. So that, that's what we're asking for. But again, every expenditure will be debated here and discussed and done in public, right? So no money is being committed. It's just permission to borrow the money when the time is right. Um, the third point I want to make is um, uh, about buses and just about sort of expertise in general. Uh, I'm an economist. I'm not an expert on electric buses. Uh, no one on the board, I believe, is an expert on electric buses. And that is why we have engineers. So on a lot of things, if I'm on some of the financial matters and things like e-buses, we don't make these decisions without doing our research. We have an engineering team that advises us. So we're very aware of what's happening at TCAT. We're very aware of the challenges with electric buses. And we don't blindly make these purchases. We go to trained engineers and say, advise us on how to do this in the most responsible way. So I'll end there. Okay. <clears throat> I'll just say just say a couple of words. Everybody already spoke, and we've been here for a long time. My name is Adam. Um, yeah, first of all, again, I always say this, but I really appreciate everybody coming out. Um, it's very important to participate in local government. It's really good to hear from everybody in the community. So just a very big thank you. Whether the budget passes, you know, as it is, um, or if it doesn't pass, and we go to a budget that's $9 million less. Either way, um, it's an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and we know that it comes on the shoulders of taxpayers. Um, you know, as a parent of two children in the district, um, you know, I share your interest in making sure that, you know, for this investment, we have the strongest possible academic curriculum um, and that all students are meeting academic standards. I think that's very important. Um, and I just wanted to say that. So thank you. I'll also be quick because I'm I'm cognizant that it's late and you guys have been here and you've listened for a long time. So thank you. Thank you for coming. It takes a tremendous amount of bravery to stand up at a microphone. Um, so I've been pondering as I've been taking notes on what everyone has said as to things that were new to me, things that were surprising. But it also struck me that the next vote is not a board vote. The next decision to be made is is the community's vote. So I, I, th I think I'm encouraged by that because the next decision to be made is the voters. One month ago, we had another packed room and it was full of a similar sentiment. And at that point, we were able to take that information and be responsive to it. And I, I think that I joined with all of us that we are grateful for your input because even after next Tuesday's vote, that will give us more information with which we will continue to try to make good decisions as the volunteers that we are. 
And so the next vote is yours. The next vote isn't ours. We'll be voting on some policies and some things tonight, later on. Maybe if we ever get home, will we ever get home? Not tonight. But I just wanted to say I'm, I'm grateful and and I hope you guys talk to your neighbors. Um, like another board member said, seek out information either from the board, you can email us, seek it out from the website. Um, I apologize if there were you felt like things were misleading. Um, but I'm I'm grateful for your participation. And my name is Katie. Hi. Um, I have uh, long been weary of technology, and I say to my students jokingly that I'm wearing my Apple spy pieces. And um, I'm mentioning that because this evening, the number of times that my watch told me that my heart was elevated um, <laughs> was more than I anticipated and actually has me a little bit concerned. What I'm hoping that is is a demonstration of empathy that uh, I'm moved and trying to wrestle with the somewhat untenable position that we find ourselves in as volunteers who choose to be in this position and take the good faith of our community to be elected into these positions. This is my 15th year on the board and uh, we have been in similar situations over those 15 years, including uh, contentious budget debates and votes and budgets that have been voted down, especially during the 2008 uh, recession and, and beyond. Um, I'm choosing to respond for a couple of reasons. One, I would like as much as possible to remove the sentiment or some of the narrative I'm hearing about the board versus homeowners or taxpayers, as if we're not one and the same, as if we won't see each other at, you name the place, a baseball game, Wegmans, the farmer's market, wherever it may be, walking on a trail. Uh, my assessment, like other folks, went up six figures. I said this before. I have to struggle to figure out how I'm gonna pay whatever it may be. And it doesn't matter if it's this budget or a contingency budget, my taxes are still going up. Your taxes will still go up. I have proposed at one point in time, and I'll do it again publicly, I would like all taxing entities to have to sit in a room together and have some conversations along with the assessment office, not to point fingers at one another, but to have a much more engaged conversation about what does it mean to live in this community. So I wanna say that as well, we're taxpayers too. My grandbabies at Enfield, my wife's family owns a home here. My brothers-in-law are both graduates of the Ithaca City School District. This is my community and I've been here for 30 years. And I say this as well to longer term Ithacans. I know that 30 years does not make me an Ithacan, but I'm gonna claim it anyway. When someone asks um, about why did we receive this mailer this late, that is not us. That's dictated by the state. Why do we have this hearing at this time? That is not us. That is dictated by the state. And so a number of things that people are rightfully angry about or questioning are also parts of the things that we are responding to that are outside of our control, but trying to respond. So the budget, yes, I will agree and I will modify my board colleague, Dr. Jill Tripp's language. I would, I'm gonna make the assumption that every board member believes that Cornell and other entities could pay more, not some of us, right? We're aware of the hardship. We're aware of it, we feel it, it's within our families. And lastly, at the risk of getting myself in trouble, a number of folks had made mention of equating the budget to poor academic performance because four schools have been identified on the state list. When I ran for the board, Newsweek ranked Ithaca High School the 83rd best high school in the country. It was plastered about, we celebrated it, we patted ourselves on the back. 
and the graduation rate for black children was 51%. And so I struggled to understand how a school of academic excellence could struggle to educate its black and brown babies. Those two schools that you're talking about that have recently been placed on a list are because of a particular subgroup of students, which are black and brown babies. That's why we are on that list. So if we're gonna talk about the budget, let's please separate that from our inability at this point in time to fully educate folks, or if we are gonna connect them, let's do so with the understanding of exactly how that goes down. That is not to say that we shouldn't have conversations about the budget or budget reductions. And if you folks have been paying attention a long time, the number one area to be cut will be administration. That has been stated repeatedly and will be continued to be stated. But I also want us to recognize that we are on that those lists because we have to do more for various subgroups of marginalized students. And I apologize. I should have began by thanking everybody for coming to speak. I do thank you and we do hear you. At this point in time, at this higher, higher, take a look at the equity report card. It changes from year to year, but they are definitely higher. Last I knew they were in the low 80s. But again, take a look at the equity report card. We are done with tonight's budget hearing. You can contact any board member at any point in time or all of us, and we will continue to be as responsive as we possibly can. We thank you for coming out. We will take a break before we continue on with our regular board meeting for this evening.